then we said, let's go further. Let's, uh, since we are already using Lightning, let's also create a Lightning channel, including uh, a non-broadcast commitment to some, R, to some token transfer. So you, we can transfer the token without even going online. We can just transfer the token off chain. And, and then only when you do settlement of the channel, there will be a settlement on the token structure as well. So this was the start of RGB and I presented it in uh, Lisbon in a uh, building on Bitcoin. Uh, I also tried to give a, an attempt of a justification of the possible legit use cases. So in my opinion, even if you don't have a legit use case for an RGB, I actually don't care because for me, this is an experiment for a general design for Bitcoin itself in the future. So if we manage to create a Bitcoin over RGB, which some kind of two-way peg mechanism, then we have better privacy for Bitcoin itself. So it's, it's a, we can actually use it as an opt-in transition to a client-side validation model, which is interesting to me as a theoretical experiment. So I don't care even if 99% of RGB use cases are scammy. It's still a interesting design experiment. But furthermore, there may be some actually legit use cases. And I could mention basically uh, two. Uh, there, there actually was a third, but it was not re very relevant. The first one was collectibles. I was thinking, or, you know, rare pepes, uh, they are on counterparties. But it's bad because in counterparty, the, the first problem you have is that you're not sending the image of the frog. You are sending just the, 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 the signature on the hash. And then you have to maintain a public repository of the images of the frog like Pepe directory. So uh, this is just the same with NFTs uh, today. You have to maintain a public repository, maybe and maybe IPFS, but still you have to maintain uh, um, the, the data somewhere. And also this data must be public. So I cannot even say I created this artwork. I will send only to you the, uh, the, um, the, like the high resolution version. And then you will be the only one, not just having the signature, but also having the, the, the file itself. Then of course, if you sell the file again and again, there will be inflation in the number of people that, that holds the, the, the file itself. But at least we can have like slow inflation. Like I can, have, I can send you a secret NFT that only you have, and then only the person that you will sell to. And this will actually decrease the scarcity of the image, but slower than with a public repository like IPFS or Rare Pepe. So in RGB, I will actually include the image of the frog within the off-chain proof that I'm sending you. Of course, I cannot put the image of a frog on a upper turn on a blockchain because it would be super expensive, but I can just send it to you and use RGB just to commit and that will, will work. So uh, collectibles will be, will be one, one use case. The other use case will, will be basically, um, uh, let, let's say, uh, legal arbitrage uh, for secondary market. For example, Tether. Tether is a company issuing USD credit, basically. But if they did that, uh, it's completely centralized. They can just decide not to give you the money back. Since it's centralized, they can, uh, the typical Bitcoiner answer will be, just use a database, just use MySQL. Why are you using, using a blockchain if it's a centralized promise? And the possible answer by Tether, which is a legit answer, will be, wait, I'm forced to do KYC and AML and blacklisting when I sell Tether to people buying it from Tether Corporation and when I'm redeeming dollar to people sending me Tether back. But in the secondary market, people could just use this open protocol I have no control about and they could just, uh, uh, they could just maybe uh, trade Tether uh, to Bitcoin in, without KYC, without AML and I cannot be asked to stop it because you see regulator, I'm just using an open standard. I can be asked to do KYC on the primary market, but I cannot be asked to do that on the secondary market. So there may be a point for some particular, maybe you can have something similar on securities as well. So it's, it's more difficult, but somebody could say the SEC, uh, wait, uh, wait a sec, uh, I, can, I can just sell my security to, um, to like sophisticated investor certified uh, by the SEC, but then I don't know if they are doing something in the secondary market. And this will be especially interesting with RGB because with RGB, when you look at the blockchain, you don't know if people are even exchanging on the secondary market. You cannot know. Basically what you know is that if I send a, to a RGB token to you, I know that I send it to you. Then if uh, Ricardo 
sends that token back to me, I know that somehow it went from you to Ricardo, but I cannot see uh, even ex post, I cannot see what happened in between because uh, what we, I, I omitted to mention another thing, the idea was since we are sending the, um, the proof of the past transaction chain, the past, the, 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 the past transaction DAG, we are sending it off band, we can actually uh, use uh, uh, advanced cryptography like uh, bulletproof to actually uh, compactify history so that you will just uh, uh, see the net round and not every single passage. So I, I give a tether, uh, USDT to you, uh, Lawrence. You give it to, uh, to somebody that gives it, somebody that gives it to uh, Julian Assange, that gives it to Ross Ulbricht, that gives it to o Osama Bin Laden or whatever, then Osama gives, uh, who is not dead, but secretly living with Elvis in an island, is, uh, is giving that token to Ricardo, and Ricardo is giving the token back to me. Uh, dear regulator, I don't know what happened to the token. I cannot see it. It's not on the blockchain. I can only tell you that somehow the token that I gave to Lawrence is coming back to me from, by Ricardo. But in between, it's opaque from me, just protocol, protocol level, which would be interesting. Of course, it's not a guarantee of uh, uh, successful regulatory arbitrage because the regulators could just say, okay, they could just say, okay, you're forbidden from using this protocol. Uh, if you use this protocol, I just shut you down. But if you say, you know, it's like a global standard, it's like the internet, uh, I'm forced to use it by the fact that it's uh, everybody using it, maybe you can have some sort of, uh, of, um, of escape uh, uh, of plausible deniability. So these are two interesting use cases. And indeed, uh, originally, um, Bitfinex with Tether and, uh, and, and Bitrefill actually, and another company which is called Fulgur Venture, another company called Poseidon, they put some money in the development of RGB. Now, the current state, and then I finish this over long first answer, the current uh, development is a little bit uh, getting more complex even to me, because uh, the idea that the main, the, 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 the prototype was developed by Alecos Fellini, but Alecos Fellini then went to work first for Blockstream and then for BDK, uh, Bitcoin Development Kit, uh, sponsored by Square. So now Alecos is not working on RGB anymore. And then Maxim Orlowski took over and developed the, the, ma the major part of the code base. And he's also very much interested in complex contracts. Like uh, he's, uh, he's basically, his point is that what is, would be a bad idea to do on, on chain like with Ethereum. So having on chain miners validating complex compl uh, contracts with all the problems of front running like uh, the famous MEV discussion today all the problems of scalability or privacy, you don't have those on RGB because everything is just peer-to-peer -peer and off-chain. So you can actually do special scripting languages and special virtual machine and do like something like Ethereum, but in a reasonable way. So he's taking more that complex direction, which uh, I'm fine with, but uh, I'm, I'm not really interested in contracts. And I, I think that people right now, the only contracts people actually use are multi-sig for, for security an escrow and uh, plus uh, occasionally some time lock uh, and lightning, but except for uh, uh, an atomic swaps for uh, atomic stuff like coin join or coin swap. But except for these, uh, in, on Ethereum, people are not even using all that uh, super dangerous, super flexible uh, language. They are just issuing tokens and selling tokens to people and people are trading tokens. And that's basically all that's happening, except for, uh, I would say, um, like uh, oracles on, um, or stuff like uh, MakerDAO, which can be fairly reproduced with multi-sig, because still it's a multi-sig with an oracle. And then they're doing uh, uh, Uniswap, which is atomic swap, which is the same you could do in Bitcoin with uh, coin swap and stuff like that, uh, or atomic swap between Bitcoin and other stuff. So it, it's, people are not really using this uh, amount of complexity. So my, my, uh, my understanding and my interest is specifically uh, focused on the issuing something, transferring something and, and getting it back with maximum privacy and maximum scalability possible. And uh, I'm, uh, so if, if I have to explain you the current uh, RGB code base, I'm not even able because it's, sup it's way more complex than my original vision. I still, uh, uh, I can just add one last thing, which is 
leveraging Lightning to transmit the proof of chain is something that I think uh, the current code base is doing reliably. Uh, while leveraging Lightning for backup, I think that's not yet there because Lightning itself doesn't have yet a good backup standard. There are some plugins of C Lightning, some practices on LD, some centralized stuff on uh, Moon and Phoenix and, 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 um, and Breeze, but there is not yet a reliable standard for uh, decentralized backups, maybe based on your seed and stuff like that, which I was envisioning back then. So we will probably have to wait in order to leverage that as well. Gotcha. Thanks. That was um, yeah, that was a really good answer. Actually, there's a, there's a lot I kind of want to. There's a lot I've kind of been thinking of and like thinking to ask you. But um, yeah, I can see. I mean, I guess I can see immediately how you could use uh, from what you've described um, RGB for like some form of synthetic assets, kind of like as you said with Tether, um, things like you could do gemstones and you could uh, create some kind of token that represents gemstones stored somewhere, and then you can then you know people that can know that they can privately be sent that without anyone else knowing until they get back to the original um what impact will taproot and like the the advanced scripting that taproot's going to allow people to do with bitcoin transactions um how will that impact rgb uh it, it wouldn't really uh it will have it, it, negatively in the, in the sense that uh, now every wallet has to rewrite everything in order to uh, really exploit uh, the the big advantages of taproot which includes every Lightning wallet. So probably many Lightning implementation will have to rewrite stuff from scratch. And so probably RGB will have to follow that process. And this could actually just delay the standardization. Uh, I don't think that RGB, that there is actually, if you search for it, I think Maxim Orlowski, the main developer of RGB, gave a presentation of Taproot and the impact of Taproot for, for Bitcoin and for RGB specifically. Uh, long term, there may be some some actually good interaction. Uh, the, 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 I think that for me, uh, Maxim gave a very long list of interaction. For me, the main interaction uh, at equilibrium in the long term, long term is this: uh, Taproot extend the problem of backups from Lightning to every kind of uh, complex Bitcoin, Bitcoin transaction. Because now, uh, like if you do if you do some kind of complex P2SH script and then you have your seed and also have the public keys of the other people, but you lose the script, you can still brute force it because basically the, uh, the, this, the, uh, the size of the script is, uh, is uh, there is a maximum. You can try to like, uh, uh, you can try the ordering of the public keys and then you brute force it and you recover it if it's standard. With Taproot, all the Taproot part, you have to back it up independently because there is no trivial way you could brute force it. In theory, it could be like super giant. So with Taproot, it will become a common practice that the user of complex scripts like multi-sig and stuff will have to back up their seed and all the Taproot script included the other XPUBs or the other uh, public keys, not just, uh, uh, not just their seed. So in a way, uh, your counterpoint to client side validation is becoming stronger with Taproot because it's even more obvious that just the seed is not going to uh, save your Bitcoin in complex situation. 